I'll be the day I'll be back. And then this is the Messiah. And then we're in Damascus. Goodness. Flying. I wasn't expecting it to go so quickly. Funny how that just it just keeps going. church. Good morning. It is good to have you here with us this morning. We've still got a few people making their, their way in, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with some announcements. Um, for the service today, you should have two pieces of paper in your hand. One is a piece of music, and one is a long, skinny piece of paper, and I'm going to tell you what it is that you're going to need to do with that in, during the children's message but you'll want to have something to write with. So if you want to go ahead and dig around in pockets and purses, there may be some pencils in the compartments on the, on the chairs. We don't know if they got left there or not. So just to give you a heads up um, to find something to write with. Um, ah, we have our talent show and pie social coming up on the 8th of April. We need talent. I know we have it. It is out there. We need you to f not feel too um, intimidated that you are not going to want to share your talent. This night is all about fun and fellowship. So think about the talent that you have. Think about the talent that you don't have that you are still willing to share and sign up. We're also asking people to sign up for the pie social itself. So the pies are taken care of. We just need to get an idea of how many people um, we think will be here. So that is on the table out in the, in the narthex. 
We are still collecting for one great hour of sharing. If you are interested in making a contribution to our church's um, contribution to one great hour of sharing, there are um, those giving envelopes are on the table in the narthex, or you can just simply make your check out to the church and write OGHS for one great hour of sharing in the memo line. You can also donate to One Great Hour of Sharing through our website. There's a, there's a place on that giving form on our website where you can identify if you want it to go towards a specific thing and you can just put OGHS in, in that spot as well. And those are all of the announcements that I have for today. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Okay. We're here for worship, my friends. As we begin this time of worship, I invite you to just settle into a comfortable place in body and spirit. Set aside whatever might distract you from being fully present in this time. Let God hold your worries, your frustrations, your to-do list, even, even your hopes and simply be in God for the next hour. All those things that want to get your attention will be waiting for you when we are through here. This is the time to settle into God, who has probably been waiting to get your attention for quite some time. So settle into this time and give all that you are to God. Welcome to worship.
morning. I've told you before, but this is the best seat because you get to see Tyler work his magic. Uh, it, would you please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship? May we find courage here. Courage to follow our call. Courage to live out our faith. May we find hope here. Hope for a better world. Hope that refuses to let us go. May we find truth here. Truth that lives in sacred community. Truth that lives in ancient stories. May we find all that we seek. And in our seeking, may we know God. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious, Gracious God, God, we seek your presence you. here today. Make yourself known to us in song and word and in sight and in touch. Remind us anew of who you are and your plan for us in your world. Transform us, challenge us, empower us to be the servant church of the servant Christ in whose name we pray. Our first hymn is Come, O Fount of Every Blessing, which is in the New Century Hymnal 454. the young people that are here with us today to come on up. That's it. Aliyah is your only sibling that's here today. Oh, the other two. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're all here. How is everybody? know what this is. Does that look familiar? Yeah, it's it's our prayer chain or it's 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 our Sunday school's prayer chain. And and the Sunday school class has been working on this during what season in the church year is it? Do you remember? Lent. Yeah, Lent, not to be confused with lint. Lint is what's in your pocket. Lent is the season that's before Christmas, right? Easter. Easter. It's the season that's before Easter. 
So when Janet showed me this prayer chain, first of all, I was very, very impressed and really, really pleased. That's a lot of prayers for just three weeks. And that means that you, in our Sunday school class, have been really paying attention to your family and your friends and your neighbors and your classmates and yourself and your what? James. Your James? James. Games. Is that part of your prayers? So I'm talking about the things that you've been paying attention to that you have brought to Sunday school and put on the prayer chain. And because that tells us that you've been paying attention to what's going on around you. Yeah. You usually do. I know you do. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to look at the picture that's up on the on the wall. You see those those brightly colored flags. Do those remind you of anything? What does that remind you of? Have you ever been driving down the street and, and there's a, a used car lot and they'll have brightly colored flags hanging above the cars or sometimes they'll have one of those goofy blow up people that the thing blows up and it wiggles back and forth. They do that to get your attention. So there are places in the world, kind of a long, mostly a long way away from here, that it's their practice. Instead of doing a prayer of chain, a, a chain of prayers, they do prayer flags. So they write their prayers on this brightly covered fabric, and they put it on a on a string and stretch it between a couple of trees or between a couple of posts, and they do that because whose attention do you think they want to get? God's, that's right. It's, it's their way of saying, hey, God, pay attention over here. Do we really need to put flags up to get God's attention? No, we don't. But sometimes it reminds us when we do things like pray and when we do things like put up prayer chains and make a chain of prayers, that God is getting our attention to. Hmm. How might you think God would be getting your attention? Probably by making Leah get my attention. By making Leah, Leah get your attention. You know, when we were sitting here. He probably is the most annoying girl that I've ever met. She, we like her that way. So when we were sitting here this morning and, and Tyler was playing the organ, and, you know, we've got the door open to help bring some fresh air in here, I heard birds. I heard birds outside singing, and it was like, yep, God was getting my attention, and it was really neat to have the sound of the birds and the sound of the organ, and it was like God just brought them together in this really, really neat way. And it's like, yep, God, thank you for getting my attention and now I can pay attention to worship a little bit better. So those of you that are seated out there, you have a little piece of paper that's either purple or yellow or white. And I'm going to invite you through the service as God gets your attention about something. I'm going to invite you to maybe write that down in the form of a prayer. So maybe God will get your attention about the need of somebody that you know. Or maybe God will get your attention about a special piece of music that, that we are singing that you like. And you can write a thank you prayer. And then I'm going to invite you to just leave those on the little table in the back. You don't have to put your name on them. Or you can take them home with you too if you think God will be wanting you to have that little piece of paper with you to get your attention throughout the week. So we won't, and then we'll be adding, we'll be making, the ones that get left here, we'll be making another um, chain of prayers. We're going to let the Sunday school continue to add to this one, I think, and, and then we'll be starting to build some of our own here. And just remember, that's one of the things that prayer is about, is about God. Getting, uh, God getting our attention 
And sometimes it's helpful for us to think that we can get God's attention in our prayers too. So speaking of prayer, let's do. We're going to do this kind of prayer though. We're going to put our hands up in the air like we're a little prayer flag. And we're going to get God's attention. Ready? Let's pray. Hey God. Here we are. Your church. We are here for worship and Sunday school. Thank you for getting our attention. Amen. Thank you. And as you go to Sunday school, we are going to be singing um, our sending song. So have a great time in Sunday school, and I'll see you later, okay? Yeah, that's kind of neat to be thinking about your sisters and brothers, your siblings, as God's way of getting your attention. few things as powerful as a group of people that admits they are not perfect and asks for grace as they grow. Imagine what our world might be like if every institution had such a weekly rhythm. Friends, we can light the way. Let us be brave in our truth-telling and honest in our confession, for we will always be met by grace. Let us pray. Jesus of Nazareth, we admit that often we tuck our faith into our pockets, hiding it in a place of comfort, rather than proudly declaring, yes, we are Christian, yes, we believe, yes, this faith has changed me. We are so afraid of offending others or embarrassing ourselves that we have established rules. No faith at the dinner table, no faith in politics, no faith with strangers. Forgive us for whispering when we could be singing. Forgive us for staying quiet when we could be part of rewriting the narrative. We want to be brave. We want to pour out perfume over your feet. These things we pray, amen. Family of faith, hear this good news. Even in our silence, God loves us. Even in our fear or shame, God chooses us. Even when we sin, God wraps us in grace. You are free to be bold, to be brazen, to be exactly who God called you to be. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together in singing our sung response in God Alone. It's the handout that you received as you came in. We're going to be singing it through three times. I think Tyler's going to play once, and then we'll sing three times.
Here a reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She has bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. This is the reading for today. May God's blessing be added so that we have heard what we have heard and lead us to deeper understanding. Thank you, Hank. Well, John's gospel could be said to be the gospel of extravagance. Unlike Mark, which is all about conciseness and urgency, and Matthew, which is about lifting up the connection of the new covenant in Jesus Christ with the old covenant established with Moses and extended through the prophets, and Luke, which is all about evening things out, you know, raising the lowly and bringing down the mighty. John is about the lengths to which God will go to be in relationship with the world, with people, with us. John's gospel is about extravagance. From the very beginning, John is just over the top. Where, where Mark doesn't talk about Jesus' origins at all and begins with a fully adult Jesus, and where Matthew and Luke give us those lovely birth stories with angels and shepherds and inns with no room and wise men and stars, John goes bigger, much bigger. Jesus, the way that John tells it, has been around from the very beginning, before day one. And John's not content with Jesus simply being God's offspring. No, not in John. Jesus is more than that in John's gospel. Jesus is none other than God. So John's Jesus is extravagant. His first miracle, remember his first miracle, that changing water into wine? And remember that it wasn't any run-of-the-mill stuff. It, this is not wine that comes out of a box. And it is the best, and there is so much of it. He not only gives the bread of life, he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is living water. He not only calms storms, he walks on them. According to John, Jesus does more than merely cure illness. He brings people back from the dead. People like Jairus' daughter and Lazarus. And it's in the presence of Lazarus that this once dead person, this once dead person, Lazarus, and his sisters, Mary and Martha, that another act of extravagance occurs. Only this time, it's not Jesus who is the extravagant one. It's Mary. Apparently, this extravagance condition is contagious. 
how can you be in the presence of one that embodies extravagance and not join in? This was not a first or a one-time encounter. Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Jesus, they go way back. They've been friends for a long, long time. And their friendship, it ran deep. Deep enough that when Jesus realized earlier that Lazarus has died, he wept. And then he brings him back to life. So when Jesus is the guest in the house of his friends on his way to Jerusalem, extravagance is the order of the day. And this time it comes from Mary. She brings forth this jar of ointment that was usually set aside for something very specific. It was ointment that was to be used on the bodies of the dead. She opens it up, and there's this aroma that, that comes out. It, the aroma is originally intended to hide the stench of the dead, but this aroma explodes into the room. And then she pours it over his feet and wipes them with her hair. It's not only extravagant, it is scandalous. Mary's act points towards her devotion to Jesus. It also reveals the journey that awaits him, a journey that will lead to his death. This is not the last time that his body will be anointed with the ointment that is reserved for death. Mary, in her own insightful way, knew this and let Jesus know that she knew it. It was shocking to others, but not Jesus, and not Mary. Mary's act of extravagance sets the stage for an act of extravagance that Jesus was about to undergo, which set the stage for God's ultimate act of extravagance. So that's the teaser for today. If you're curious about what that extravagance is going to be, come back in three weeks. Extravagant acts. What acts of extravagance might we be called into? In anticipation of and in response to God's extravagance, how are we being called and equipped to respond? We're not Mary with that jar of burial ointment. We're definitely not Jesus with his changing water into wine, raising the dead powers. We may do some pretty extravagant and outlandish things from time to time, but the extravagant love of God isn't always revealed with fanfare and drama. Sometimes it's in the extravagance of small things, like chocolate and simple acts of kindness at just the right time. Several years ago, photographer and filmmaker Jan Artus Bertrand created a film dedicated to reveal what it is that makes us human. The film, titled Human, is a collection of stories told by people telling their own stories of, of what it is to be human, of their very human lives. They are stories of love and hatred and violence and happiness. Each story that is told brings the viewer face to face, literally face to face with the one who not only tells the story, but lives it. I share with you today one person's story, Francine Christoph, a Nazi concentration camp survivor. She tells her story in French, her native language, but there are English, there will be English subtitles on this screen, but they're, they're kind of small. 
So I'm going to try to read them so you'll be able to hear Francine's story. Je m'appelle Francine My name is Francine Christophe. Christophe. Je suis née le 18 I was born on August something 1933. 1933 was the year when Hitler took power. Voilà. Look. This is my star. Je la porte I had to wear it on my chest, of course. Gros, pas? It's big, isn't it? Sur Especially for a child. That was when I was eight years old. When I was at Bergen-Belsen camp, an amazing thing happened. Let me remind you, as the children of prisoners of war, we were privileged. We were permitted to bring something from France, a little, a little bag with two or three small items. One woman brought chocolate, another some sugar, a third a handful of rice. My mom had packed two little pieces of chocolate. She said to me, we'll keep this for a day when I see you've collapsed completely and really need help. I'll give you this chocolate and you'll feel better. One of the women imprisoned with us was pregnant. You couldn't tell she was so skinny. But the day came and she went into labor. She went to the camp hospital with my mom, the barracks chief. Before they left, my mom said, remember that chocolate I was saving for you? Yes, Mama. How do you feel? Fine, Mama. I'll be okay. Well, then, if it's all right with you, I'd like to bring your chocolate to this lady, our friend Helene. Giving birth here will be hard. She may die. If I give her the chocolate, it may help her. Yes, Mama, go ahead. Helene gave birth to the baby, a tiny little feeble thing. She ate the chocolate. She did not die. She came back to the barracks. The baby never cried, never. He didn't even wail. Six months later, the camp was liberated. They unwrapped the baby's rags and the baby screamed. That was when he was born. We took him back to France, a puny little thing for six months. A few years ago, my daughter asked me, Mama, if you deportees had had psychologists or psychiatrists when you returned, maybe it would have been easier for you. I replied, undoubtedly, but we didn't have them. No one thought of mental illness. But you gave me a good idea. We'll have a lecture on that topic. I organized a lecture on the theme if the survivors of concentration camps had had counseling in 1945, what would have happened? The lecture drew a crowd, elderly survivors, historians, and many psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists. Very interesting. Many ideas emerged. It was excellent. Then a woman took the podium and said, I live in Marseille where I am a psychiatrist. Before I deliver my talk, I have something for Francine Christophe. In other words, me. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a piece of chocolate. She gave it to me and she said, I am the baby. Chocolate, two small pieces of chocolate. It's not the first thing 
that you would think about when talking about extravagance. This really isn't about chocolate, is it? It's about kindness. When given even in small amounts, a simple act of kindness can be enough to make the difference between life and death, between despair and hope, anger and understanding. Kindness or mercy or compassion, they're perhaps the most extravagant thing that God has done. Because of kindness, Jesus gave sight to the blind. Because of compassion, Jesus healed the sick. Because of mercy, Jesus forgave even those who would take his life. It just doesn't get any more extravagant than that. The church has long proclaimed itself to be the body of Christ on earth. It's, that's, you got to think that that's a pretty extravagant claim. It's one that we haven't always lived up to or into. But thank God, and, and I mean literally, thank God, the church is still around for another day. Another day to be given the chance to be what we say we are, not just to those who have come to the door, but with and for one another. Everyone we encounter comes with a story, a very real story that makes them human, a very real story of a child of God a very real story of life that could perhaps have been saved through a simple, extravagant act of kindness or mercy or compassion or chocolate. As you leave today, I'm going to have a bowl in the back of the sanctuary, and it's going to have chocolate in it. I invite you to pick up two pieces of chocolate from the container at the door. One is for you. One is for someone else, someone who could use a bit of extravagant love in their lives. May this extravagant example of two pieces of chocolate remind us that it doesn't take much. May the essence of what Mary has done be a model for us. And whether we live out our discipleship with gifts of chocolate or through extravagant, lavish acts of kindness, may God's extravagant love always embrace and unite us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able, and let's join together in singing My Life Flows On. It's number 476.
time of prayer, uh, sharing our joys and concerns with, with one another as we lift them to God in, in prayer. Um, just an update on Debbie Rothweiler. She had her heart catheterization on Monday, and her heart looks great. So that just means that they need to do some further testing to find out what was causing that episode that she had a, about a little over a week ago. We will continue to hold um, the people of Ukraine and Russia in our, in our prayers as well, and the world leaders um, that have traveled um, to, to come together in summit to have conversation and decision around, around that tragedy. What other joys and concerns do you bring with you today? Bonnie. So for Bonnie's brother-in-law, Ray, who's in ICU on a ventilator. Yes. Got, got everything going into him. Pick line oxygen. Okay, prayers for Ray. Anything else this morning? Yes, Kara. Family that's traveling this week for Kara's father's memorial and for that memorial service. It all goes well. That's Saturday, right? Yes. Yeah. Sharon. Okay, so Sarah's granddaughter has a strange stomach ailment that they're investigating. Okay. What's her name? Ellie. Ellie. Okay. Thank you. Anything else this morning? Cindy will start us off with the singing of our prayer song, and then we'll enter into a time of prayer together. Uh, that, that segment will end with the Lord's Prayer, and then Cindy will close us out with the prayer song. our waking is a prayer. Sometimes the song we have stuck in our heads rumbling around on repeat is a prayer. Sometimes the way we talk to the children and the way we hug the dog is a prayer. Sometimes the way we take our phones out to get a picture of the sunset or of the people we love, that's a prayer. Other times prayer is moments like this. Heads bowed, eyes closed, hearts quiet for just a moment. And in all of it, we trust you to hear us. Help us to hear you in return. Gratefully, we offer our prayers. For the people who live in the midst of violence and war, for those waking into an existence of abuse and addiction. For those longing to hug away the pain of disease and illness. For those who take their phones out to see if they have any calls, emails, texts, and find none. For those who lie awake throughout the night with the pangs of hunger. For those who seek safety from family, neighbors, employers, themselves. For those whose prayer is laughter and joy. For your church whose prayer is heard best when it is spoken in actions of love and justice. Hear 
our prayers and embrace us as we share the prayer of your Son, our Savior, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. hemisphere we have just entered into spring that time of year when the amount of sunlight exceeds the amount of time we dwell in nighttime darkness we see songs of new life songbirds welcoming the soft light of the morning daffodils and tulips pushing their way forth as the soil warms Buds on trees starting to get plump and eager to open into leaves that will feed and nurture those trees and give us shade throughout the summer. And with the returning of the light, our own spirits rise and open up. This gift of returning light and life and warmth blesses us and the world around us. As we prepare to leave this place and to go out into this beautiful spring creation. Let us consider our response to this extravagant act of God. And I invite you to join with me in hymn number 565, God whose giving knows no ending. Let us stand as you are able.
place. May you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all of your living and breathing and being, may you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit. And may it change your life. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go in peace, full to the brim. Amen. And please be seated for the postlude.